All right. Um, this is a lot of people to talk about hashing. Because it's not exactly a hot topic. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually going to joke that it does because it's really hot in here. Oh, sorry, should I? Yeah, put that on. It helps. All right. I thought it was about check caching. That's better. Check, check. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, yes, this is not check caching. It's the other thing, and it rules everything. Um, and it is hot, because it's literally hot in here. Um, and you're wondering, why is caching hot? Why is that such a big deal? You're hearing a lot about it with Drupal 8. That's because Drupal 8's hot. Um, like half the tables out here in the hall I see folks have flyers saying, let's check out Drupal 8. We've been doing it for two or three years. Everyone's talking about it. Um, so I read some more, you're supposed to start with a joke. Um, <laughs> this is going to be a great one. <laughs> I bet no one has ever heard this one before. <laughs> There's 200 problems in computer science. Uh, yeah, yeah, everyone said that. Um, those are naming things, cache and validation, and off by one years. <laughs> um, I'm just going to come. Yeah. I'm just going to cover naming things real quick because Drupal 8 is awesome about naming things. Um, you get lovely, long, long, long names for things like uh, Container Pack uh, Factory Plugin Interface. Um, this was another good one. Entity Definition Update Manager Interface. Um, no. <laughs> Which is really nice and short, but that is, there's like eight classes in Drupal 8 called No. Is the same one the longest one? Uh, no, it's not because. There you go. There you I don't go. know if this is the longest, but it's the longest one I could find. I didn't really do an exhaustive search. Um, but the scary thing about this is its full name is actually Drupal 4 Entity Entity Last. Anyway, it's really long. Uh, so instead, let's talk about cache validation. Um, so it's hard to talk about cache validation without talking about a brief history of what that is in Drupal um, to explain why Drupal 8 is the way it is. Um, so in the really early days, um, there's actually not a lot of info, and I couldn't go back farther than Drupal 4.6, I think, on API at Drupal.org. Um, but sometime, at least in 4, maybe 3, uh, there was a full page cache that would let you say, you know, just store a copy of the whole page, and then when a user comes to here, just serve them the copy of this HTML out of the cache. Um, it wasn't super granular, and it was really tricky to invalidate. So you ended up with lots of calls to cache clear all. Um, according to API, there are 31 calls in Drupal 4.6. Um, then you have Drupal 6. Um, for the first time, blocks offered a way to granularly cache the output of a block. Uh, what does that mean? There were some constants that you could specify for each block. The system, you could say, I want to cache this for every user role on the site. That means if a user has a different role, serve them a different copy of the cache data for them. You can do that per user if you had you know, user data in there. Um, there were a few others. I think there's about five or six of those total. Um, but there's still no good way to clear the caches. Um, so there was just much cache clear all everywhere. There were at least 52 calls in Drupal 6 core. Um, so Drupal 7 came along. Uh, and one of the things it improved was the internal static caching of its functions. Um, but it didn't really do anything for the permanent caches. Um, like the block cache or the full, full page cache. Um, and there was even more cache clear all, 79 <laughs> calls. Uh, and if you're recognizing a trend here, um, that's scary. Uh, also, Drupal 7, this is big, uh, introduced the render array concept. How, who knows what a render array in Drupal is? It was really a form array in 4.7. It, yeah, I mean, it was a form array in 4.7, um, but it really became like a generic way of describing markup in Drupal 7 for the first time. And you actually had a render array that represented your whole page uh, markup, all the regions. Um, and it could have metadata attached to it, um, although it didn't do a lot with that, but that's going to play in big. Um, but yeah, those, all those cache clear alls, there's a solid growth trend there. Um, I imagine if you got to like, if we didn't do anything, that Drupal like 11 would look like this. It's just <laughs> cash clear all kind of, anyway. Um, so Drupal 8, um, something had to change. So I think 2009 or so there was an issue open and it took like three and a half or four years to get in. 
um, but it introduced cache tags um, and there was a separate issue for cache contacts. Um, I'm going to go over what, what those are. Uh, it also added render caching at a later date once that data was available. Um, and what that means is that each of those render arrays, whether it's like something as small as a single link on a hook, hook node links or something like that, up to a block, up to a whole region, or even the whole page, can have data attached to it saying how it can be cached, um, similar to like the block caching in, that was introduced in Drupal 6. Um, finally, rest in peace, cache clear all went away forever. Um, and those globals that say like Drupal cache per page, those went away as well. So um, in Drupal 8, you'll hear the term cacheability metadata a lot, and I'm probably going to hate saying the word cacheability by the end of this because it's an awkward, very awkward word to say. Um, but you'll hear it a lot. So what is it? Um, it's simple. It just determines how something can be cached. Uh, can it be cached? Uh, how long can it be cached? When should it be cleared? And what variations of the cache need to be made? Um, and those things respond to tags, context, and the max age setting. Those are the three keys that define cacheability metadata for any uh, markup in Drupal. Um, the other cool thing is, and we'll go over this a little bit more later, is cacheability metadata bubbles up through render arrays to the whole page when you're done. Um, so even if you mark one little link, just a single HTML link with cacheability metadata, that's going to make it all the way to the top of the page, and the page, the whole page, when it's cached by the page cache, will contain that metadata and it'll be reused there. Um, so first, cache contexts. Um, cache contexts determine how something varies according uh, to a request. Usually, um, it's really analogous to the vary header in HTTP. If you've seen that, which simply says like. Uh, if I'm serving languages on a website uh, and a user requests it in one language and then um, you know I have an external cache and then another user requests it in another language, um, Vary could say, vary this caching according to the language header. And then the, the caching proxy knows, say, if you're requesting this language, I have to use a different cache. Um, it's really similar to those those Drupal 7, Drupal 6, those block constants that were like you know, cache per page, cache global. Um, but there's many, many more options here. Um, it's organized into a hierarchy, which is a little confusing at first. Uh, it has this weird concept of folding and combining, flattening, collapsing. Um, and I'll go over that a little bit too. Um, but it prevents duplication, and it actually optimizes it to ensure that your cache is as efficient as possible. Uh, some examples of cache context could be uh, cookies, headers, uh, routes, uh, session, URL, anything like that. I think even the theme that is on a page is one of the cache contexts. Um, and they're hierarchical. So user has user.permissions, uh, user.roles, uh, and you can have a parameter specified on the end after a colon as well. So uh, user roles, colon anonymous means vary this uh, cache entry based on whether or not this is an anonymous user. Um, same thing with URL. You can say, I want to do URL query yards, uh, very specific uh, argument, or you can say the path, or just the whole URL. Um, so I'm going to go over the folding collapsing thing. Um, the first thing you want to look at when you look at uh, one of those cache contexts, uh, if you say, like, um, like URL.queryArts. Um, the first item is going to cause the most granular amount of caching. Uh, if you use that, it's going to put the most variations in your cache. Um, and the last option, the farthest on the right, is going to be the most specific option, which will cause the fewest variations in your caching. Um, an example of that would be if you had URL query arts and you're looking for a foo parameter uh, in your arguments. If you use that, you're only going to have two variations, whether or not the foo is present. Well, I guess you could have variations based on the value of foo. Um, but if the path is different, if you're at like slash node one or slash node two, that doesn't matter. It's only looking at that foo parameter. Um, 
But if you use just URL by itself, uh, like URL node one slash foo or uh, the foo parameter is a different cache than like node two uh, with the same thing. Uh, so when they're present, what Drupal will do is it's going to take uh, the query yards uh, like this and the URL, and it's going to say, I'm going to vary this, I'm going to collapse them because uh, the URL encompasses the rest of that. Um, so in this case, if you're saying uh, query yards, that's more specific, uh, but URL is more granular. So it's always going to use the more granular option. And it'll actually remove that query, the uh, parameter, uh, excuse me, the context for query errors. So it's just going to take that out and just use the URL instead. Does that kind of make sense? Am I losing anyone? Um, you don't have to worry about this a whole lot. Drupal 8 is going to just take care of this underneath the scenes. Um, you don't have to worry about the details of how it works. You just specify the context you need uh, on your data. So if you want to know more, uh, I put a link in here in case you want to download the slides. The link should be in the PDF. Um, that'll take you straight to the page on Drupal.org. It has really, really good documentation on this. Um, and it actually lists all the context as well. Um, so if contexts are about defining how we vary things according to the request that's coming into Drupal, uh, I like to think of tags are things that vary uh, that represent the data that's going out in the response. Um, so cache tags describe the data that your response to the request depends on. Uh, so it represents uh, data that's managed by Drupal, uh, usually data in your database or in your config management system or that you've uh, maybe fetched from somewhere that you're managing. Uh, you're using that to describe that so you know when to invalidate caches. Um, and you can clear caches based on their tags. Um, we'll cover some examples of how this actually works. Um, the cool thing about cache tags, too, is they can be configured to work with CDNs. Um, so if you're using an external CDN to speed up your site or you're using Varnish, um, it integrates with these. Those You can actually clear pages out of your Varnish cache or your CDN uh, using tags, which is awesome because you don't have to worry about saying, well, the CDN is going to have stale content because we set a five-minute timeout there, you know, a five-minute time limit on caching. So if we publish a new post or make a mistake, we have to wait five minutes for it to clear, or we have to go in there and purge it manually. Um, you can actually configure that to be automatic, and it will only clear the pages that need to be cleared. Um, so the cool thing about cache tags is they're just strings. Um, there's nothing more complicated with them. Um, it can be literally anything that doesn't have spaces. Um, they're usually separated by colons. Um, there are a few uh, cases where they use underscores, um, but like node colon one would be an example, um, or node colon five. Node underscore list is an example of a list one. Uh, the config system. Sorry? What's node list? Uh, node underscore list. We'll cover that in a second. I have an example that uh, explains that. Um, config colon system performance, that represents the configuration of like your aggregation settings. Um, so you can cache things according to when you change those settings. Um, and you can learn more about cache tags on this page. You can download the slides with the link. Um, and we'll cover examples of how all that integrates. Um, finally, there's cache uh, max, the max age. This describes how long something can be cached as a time dependency. Um, it's just a number of seconds. Um, Drupal Core actually doesn't use this anywhere. Um, Drupal Core out of the box only uses permanent caching. Um, and you probably should too, because that's the most performant. Um, if you do that, you can manage your cache clearing using cache tags. Um, there may be cases where that doesn't make sense, but generally that's a really good standard to strive for, I think, with all your code. I think Core uses it to set it to zero for things that are not cacheable. Yeah, um, I do have another I do have an example of that. But yeah, generally though, it doesn't specify like seconds as a number of time. Um, like I said, it just expresses number of seconds. Um, and zero does mean that the item is not cacheable at all. And that actually has special meaning with some core modules. We'll get to that. Um, and there is also this uh, constant cache permanent. 
which means that an item is cacheable forever. Uh, Drupal will never expire that based on its time. It's good for infinity, basically. Um, but you have to manage clearing that for yourself with cache tags. Um, there's more examples here. So um, I'm going to go back. I talked about cache bubbling a little bit. Um, an example of that. So uh, all the data on a page usually contains is going to contain markup that uh, is tagged with cacheability metadata uh, from blocks. Blocks turn into regions. Regions turn into your whole page. Um, the duplicates are removed, uh, and the contexts are folded collapsed to reduce any uh, unnecessary context. And then all that information is used to cache the entire page, like the HTML. Um, that includes that data could also be sent to a CDN. Um, but individual components uh, are still cached at the render level. Um, so blocks can be reused even on another page. The render cache can kick in and say, this block didn't vary on the next page, so I'm going to use the render cache for that, even though I need to generate a new page cache uh, of another page. So an example of this is, this is just a stock Drupal 8 uh, screenshot. And here are some of the contexts that will uh, be applied to different parts of this. Uh, the site name is going to be tagged with uh, the system.site uh, config tag. Uh, this article is tagged node, node 4. Um, the contact link at the bottom, this is a Drupal menu. That's tagged with uh, system.menu.footer. That means uh, whenever you update that menu, it's going to clear that cache tag. So then when you get all the tags for this page, and this is actually uh, this page, all of them together, that's just a sampling of them, you get that. Uh, and that looks like a lot of things, um, and it is. But the cool thing about this is, whenever you change any of these things, Drupal knows to clear that page cache. Um, if you had pages on your site that didn't have a menu on them, for example, and you change the menu, um, those pages aren't going to be invalidated in the cache. So to tie all this together, I came up with a real world example. Um, it's mostly really way this is actually tied really closely to a site I built. Um, so I'm going to go over what what this is. It's a site that is for um, fans of space science fiction stories. Um, you can enter different content about the site, um, sorry, series or the stories. Uh, and they, the, the client says, hey, I want to show a block in the left sidebar that has related items. That just says to the same story. So when I'm viewing something about Star Trek, show me other things about Star Trek. I remember looking at Star Wars, you know, other things about Star Wars. Uh, and yes, I know that views can do this out of the box, um, but we're going to do this into custom code so that I can illustrate what each step of adding tags does and the effect it has on your site. Uh, so we're going to write some code, we're going to look at the bugs that it causes at first, and then we're going to fix those one by one. Um, so please, just trust me. Um, this is actually very similar to an actual project I did that Unfortunately, views couldn't work for it. And I actually, this is first-hand experience. I ran into all these problems myself. Um, so hopefully, you won't make these mistakes. Um, so this is our site. Um, it has a list of uh, interesting things about, in this case, it's Star Trek. Um, so we want to make a block that's going to fill in the right sidebar here, or left sidebar, excuse me, under search. Uh, so let's do that. We need to get the current node. Um, of the page we're on. We're going to query for other nodes that have the same taxonomy term, which is how we're organizing them. Uh, they're going to pass uh, the nodes that we find off to a theme function, and it's just going to print those out in the block. So that's pretty simple, right? Uh, this is roughly the pseudocode uh, that does that. Um, actually, I shouldn't say pseudocode. This is the actual code. Um, this is in a block. Uh, there's some boilerplate around the block, the constructor and the create function have left out. Um, but it just does a build, and it checks the route match surface to get the current node. And then it builds an entity query. Uh, the entity query just says, find me other nodes that have the same taxonomy term as the current node. Uh, specifically, find me the four most recent ones. Um, load those nodes, and hand them off to a template to be themed. And that's it. You should omit the current node. What? You should omit the current node. Yeah, um, 
probably should. That's a, that's a good feature request. We will add that next time. Um, so let's try it out. And we get this. Um, yeah, gee, that, that is repeated, isn't it? Um, yeah, that would actually be a one line in the query to just exclude the current node ID. Um, but there it is. I pulled in four items that are related to Star Trek um, on this article about Star Trek. So let's look around the site. Um, oh, look, I found some Battlestar Galactica stuff. And my related items are still about Star Trek. So I've got a problem. This, this isn't working right. And this is where you can all participate, because you need to wake up because it's hot in here. What's missing? Anyone? Tag. Is it a tag or a context or a max age? Who thinks it's a tag? Who thinks it's a context? Okay. Um, this is what we had. It's actually a context. This is what we're going to add. Um, we're going to add a cache ability, a uh, cacheable metadata object. And on that object, we're going to call set context, and we're going to use url.path. Uh, what this is going to do is it means that every different page we go to on our site, if the path is different, it's going to store a different cache for our block. Uh, and then finally, we take that cacheability, cacheable metadata, we apply it to the build, which is our render array, uh, and we return that. But isn't it going to show the same taxonomy terms? You should uh, split it by taxonomy Yeah, one sec, I'll show you what it does in a second. Um, Cacheable metadata, um, I'll, I'll get to that. That's, that's a good question. Um, real quick, I'm just going to cover the, the metadata is an object that just helps you manage it, uh, the cacheable data. It's just a generic class for caching that data around. Um, it provides methods to set context tags, uh, max age, and it has this apply to method. Um, and that apply to method, which is part of the render array, I'm going to show you what that does. Um, this is what our render array looked like before. Uh, I just imagine we have uh, four nodes listed there. That would be you know, eight million miles long if we actually printed it out. Um, and after we use apply to from the cacheable metadata, we get this. Uh, we have a key there that lists the context, the tags, and the max age. Um, now you'll know we only set max. We only set a context. We did not specify max age. Um, that's because Drupal 8 will default to always using permanent uh, for the maximum age. Um, you can specify it if you want, but it's a helper, so it's going to default to zero. So um, why didn't you just add that to your array? Why did you do? We'll cover that in a second. We'll get to there. Um, so after we do that, we come back here, we refresh this page. Now we get the related items for the page we're on, which is an article about someone from Battlestar Galactica, and we have related items to Battlestar Galactica. Um, just pulling in based on the term, um, on the right side there you see universe, and it says Battlestar. Um, so cool, that's fixed, right? We can now just go on because we're going to see the correct items on every page, right? No. Um, so I was wondering, are there characters from the new Star Wars movie in there. So I did, I switched for Ray. And does anyone spot something odd on this page? Yeah, um, I made a typo. Um, that's not the name of the ship from Star Wars, that is, uh, should be the Millennium Falcon. So I'll go in, I'll fix the typo, save the note, um, and then I'll go to the page and look, it's fixed. It's fixed in the sidebar over there, it says, I'm laying Falcon now. But I want to go back, say I want to go back, and I want to see, finish reading about Ray. So I type that in, click in the search. Uh, what do you notice? The typo is still there. So I'm like, didn't I fix that? And I click on it, and what do I get? I get the, the fixed typo, uh, which is odd, because if I go back to the Ray page, once again, it's misspelled again. So um, something's missing. Can anyone guess this time? Context or tag? It's a tag, yeah. Um, and this is where having this object, um, instead of just specifying the cache keys, actually makes a lot of sense. Um, because cacheable metadata uh, provides a method called add cacheable dependency. 
Um, we'll cover what that does real quick. Um, cacheable dependency takes all the cacheability metadata from an object, such as a node, in this case, and it adds it to our list of data that we've already accumulated. Um, so to do that, it uses something in Drupal called cacheable dependency interface uh, to get the context tags and max age from another object. Um, the cacheable dependency interface, it just provides a standard way to get that data. It has three methods, get the tags, get the context, get max age, um, and lots and lots and lots of objects in Drupal 8 implement this. Um, pretty much everything, actually. I found at least at least 200 classes, I think, that implement cacheable dependency interface. Um, basically, every entity, so every node, user, taxonomy term, even fields implement this, blocks implement this, uh, views, access results, configuration, forms, uh, almost everything says, I'll provide cacheable metadata if you, if you want it. Yeah? So if you're trying to take on this particular problem, what technique do you use to, can you show the metadata for a specific object and it's so how? Yeah, uh, you can do that, and you can also look at the metadata that's in use for a uh, page. Um, I'll cover some debugging techniques in a little bit, um, but yeah. So debugging this is a little tricky. Um, hopefully, if you look at an example like this, it'll help you think about um, how to write your code in such a way that you anticipate this. Um, it's just tricky the first time you're into this and you don't realize it's a caching issue, um, and you think your code's broken. Uh, but it's actually, there's nothing wrong with that query we wrote. It fetches the correct data, it's just Drupal's not running it because it thinks we already have the data gathered, uh, which is the tricky bit. Uh, so basically, yeah, anything in Drupal that represents output that can be put onto a page anywhere uh, probably implements cacheable dependency interface. Um, so if you have any question about it, you can just fire up um, in your console or your uh, devel uh, PHP page on your site and say, hey, node, you know, is there a get cache tags method on node? And odds are it will respond and give you an array of cache tags. So uh, this time after we apply uh, build, apply our cache, cacheable metadata to the build, uh, we're going to get this. We're going to get tags for all those nodes. Um, and what this does is whenever we update one of these nodes, uh, say if we save a node like the Millennium Falcon node, it's going to say everything on the site uh, that's tagged with that, we're going to clear it. So whether it's a page, which is the Millennium Falcon page, which worked correctly, or a block on another page, like we saw when we clicked on Ray, it was already cached. But if we put the tag on there, when you update the Millennium Falcon node, it says, hey, I'm going to go find everything in your system that's tagged with node 11. I'm going to clear that cache, remove it, delete it. Um, which is a really powerful cool way of uh, clearing caches compared to the old school Drupal 7. Um, so anyway, that's uh, two of four problems we're going to run into with this code uh, solved. Uh, so next. I was clicking around our site, and I found Destiny, uh, which is, of course, a starship from, if you read the text there, it says from Stargate Universe. Uh, but if you notice, I accidentally tagged it above that, it says Universe Battlestar Galactica. I made a mistake. This, this is in the, has the wrong taxonomy term on it. So, uh, yeah, there you see, yeah, that's clearly wrong. So I'm going to go in there, I'm going to edit it, I'm going to set the universe correctly, save it. Go back to that page, and you see now it says Story Universe in the breadcrumb and uh, in the field on the right side. If you look at the related items, they're still, say, Battlestar Galactica. Those didn't change. Um, so we're missing something. Anyone? Context. No. Context tag? Good tag. This one's actually a tag. Um, now this, one's a, this one's a little tricky because I actually had a hard time replicating this even though I had this problem previously. Um, and the problem was I actually used that field in the URL uh, when I built this site originally. 
So I use the universe field that says whether it's you know Star Trek or Star Wars uh, and the path auto pattern of the URL. What that meant was that my caches were automatically varied by that, whether I specified uh, the correct tags or not, because we specified URL path as a context. Um, so you need to be careful about where that data, your fields are used. Oh. Um, because sometimes you can make something work, but it's working for not the right reason. Um, it's still missing the tag, but in this case it worked until I turned off path auto, and then I could recreate this bug again. Um, so this time, we're gonna add another cacheable metadata. Uh, we're gonna say add a dependency, and we're gonna use the current node, because that is part of the input to what we're, the markup we're, we're putting out. So we depend on the data from the current node, and we also depend on those four nodes that we're listing. If any of those change, we want to invalidate this um, this markup and then regenerate the cache. So uh, this is what we had before, and now it's just going to have an extra node in there because we've added the current node. So um, like I said, I I like the site, but I feel like it was missing something. Um, it was missing a good fan I know of Star Trek. I don't know how many people are going to get this. So I thought, I know, I'll add, I'll add Larry Garfield in. Okay, never mind. Um, he's, I think he learned Drupal just to build a Star Trek fan site, but I could be wrong. Is that, does that sound right? I don't remember. Um, he's a, contributes quite a bit to Drupal. Um, and as you see, he's quite a fan of Star Trek with the open, uh, I forget what you call it. <laughs> anyway, um, so anyway, yeah, yeah, it shows up. Uh, it's great. So uh, let's say I click on him. Um, in the Star Trek, I'm going to click on him. I'll see what's in the sidebar. Yeah, he shows up. That's great. So I'm going to go back. I was reading about the Enterprise earlier, so I'm going to go back to reading about that. And you notice all of a sudden, Larry Garfield is not in the sidebar. He's not in the related items anymore. Uh, but if I go to another article, he is. But this one that I was reading earlier, he's not there. Um, which is very puzzling, because we added him. We know he's there. Um, there you go. So you know, guess what's missing this time? The tags? The comments. Backstage. Backstage. No, backstage. Tag. Actually, I'm going to hand it to you. Uh, it is a tag, and it's the note list tag. Uh, that's why I said we'll get back to this. Um, so to solve this, we're going to add another cache tag. We're going to just set this uh, at the top, because this is going to apply to everything we do. Uh, we're just going to say node underscore list. Uh, this is one of those ones that you just, I don't know, where am I? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this is one of those ones you just kind of have to know, uh, where it says node underscore list. Is node is the entity type, and um, there's just you just add underscore list on the end of it. So there's also a user underscore list, uh, term underscore list uh, in Drupal 4, and there's uh, all those for every entity type. Uh, and what happens is the storage system knows that when it saves an entity, to go clear the, uh, to send a, to clear the tag for that type of the list tag. Um, list tags, like I said, they're flushed every time a new item is created, and they're just in the form of entity type underscore list. Um, so after that, we get node underscore list as one of our tags. Um, at this point, everything actually should work the way we expect. Um, so there were four things we had to do. Um, we had to add a context for the URL. Sorry, yeah. Once you add node underscore list, you don't need the rest of the node IDs, right? Sorry? Once you add node underscore list, you don't need the rest of the node IDs. Um, that's actually, that's, Node list is only changed when you make new items. So if you update an existing item, it's not going to clear the node list tag, actually. It's only going to clear that one item's tag. Um, so for example, using node list um, wouldn't cover if you say uh, fix the typo on a node. It would only say like if I make a new thing, then it's going to call uh, the, the list tag. There's nothing called that listing. Uh, yeah, there's no one thing that covers all of them. And part of that is in order to be a little bit more 
basically you get a little bit more power this way. Um, you can say, I'm only going to clear things that list this. But like uh, on another page, it can say list. Um, it could have some other nodes, but you maybe have a tag with node list because it's an individual node page. Um, like if you're looking at node 13 or something. It's going to say, I don't need to clear that page because it's not tagged with node underscore list, for example. So, sorry? Sorry. Says it invalidates the update. Yeah. Oh, it does? I may be wrong there. Maybe you just maybe know this would do that. Um, I wanted to show you the add cacheable dependency because um, I think there are a few cases where that wouldn't work if you were using config. Uh, for example, you probably wouldn't want to clear uh, like your whole site based on one config change if it doesn't clear like. The site settings or something like that. Do you have a question? Oh. Yeah, I do, but if you, well, now it's, you're not done. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I do have the code for this module that you just looked at. Um, it's on GitHub. Um, that's the URL. If you download the slides, you can click through to that. Um, there's a tag for each step of the way, and there's a README that explains what each step fixes. Um, so you can follow along with those uh, steps we just went through. Um, so back to questions about debugging and how you develop this and figure out what you're missing. Um, so one of the first things you might want to, yeah. Can you go back to the question that Firebase is running as URL path instead of taxonomy? Here you're oh. using the context of URL path. You may have 100,000 nodes, but you may have only 100 taxonomy terms. Yeah. Why um, store it based on taxonomy terms? In this case, uh, taxonomy term is not a context. That would be a tag. Um, I'm trying to think through what that would do. Uh, you would have to, there would have to be a context for taxonomy term in order to vary the cache. Um, the tags only handle the validation. So where this cache needs to say, like I need to have a different value for each page on the site, um, the tags would help you clear it, but they wouldn't help you get the correct values on each page. It wouldn't say like, uh, with the URL path it's saying, I need to cache this block, a different copy of the block for every single page on the site. Um, but uh, taxonomy term isn't a, a, a context, that'd be a tag. Um, so look, I'm gonna go through some of that. Well, I'll go through some of the context so you can see uh, examples. Um, sorry, contacts are listed uh, in core.services.yaml. Um, they look something like this. This is just a snippet. They take up like a good, a good portion of the file, and it's fairly long. Um, they begin with cache underscore context, and the other thing is they are tagged with the name cache uh, dot context. Um, and this is just examples of them. Here's the URLs. Um, this is just URL, actually. Um, so that, that's one way to look at those. Um, there's also, there, they are all the core uh, contexts are listed on the page that I linked to earlier uh, on Drupal.org in the documentation. Um, another thing you want to do is check out the example.settings.local.php in the sites folder and the development.services.yaml file, uh, which is in there. It has some very cool, um, features that you can use to debug this. Um, but in there is also another setting that says, just completely disable the render caching. Uh, which, and it says you may want to use this for development purposes. It looks something like this. But note it says, do not use this setting until after the site is installed. Uh, but note, what does it say? In the early stages of development, you may want to disable this. I would say, don't ever disable that setting. Don't ever uncomment that line right there. Um, some very early versions of Drupal 8, I think between like alpha 11 to beta 16 or something like that, actually this file, this was uncommented. And so as soon as you enable the development uh, settings, it would automatically disable the render cache. 
Um, and that's actually how I ran into bugs with this. I actually wrote code that was pretty similar to what uh, you saw. It had a little bit more complicated query, um, but it did. It pulled in related content for different pages based on a number of fields on the node. Uh, it's a different logic. And I tested it out on my local machine. I thought, hey, this looks great. I'm going to ship it. I ship it to production. I closed the ticket out. Um, and then the next day, they reopened it and said, hey, it showed the wrong items on this page. And so I went back and I added the context. And then it happened again. Well, hey, I fixed a typo and it's not showing up. So I added tags. Uh, and that's how eventually I got to where those steps you see we went over. Um, I would recommend not ever disabling this unless um, you're not writing code that handles markup. That's the only situation I would consider disabling this. Um, there's also another one in here to disable the dynamic page cache. There's another thing that I would not recommend disabling um, because it can hide those errors in your code if you're missing those context and those tags. Um, so another thing in there is you can turn on debug cacheability headers in the settings.yaml, uh, the development.settings.yaml, excuse me. Uh, it looks something like this. Um, you just set true. Uh, and then what happens is, say I curl our site in my terminal, I'm going to get these headers back in the HTTP response. These are all uh, the tags, all the context for the current page. Um, that's really handy for debugging. Uh, one thing you can do is you can look in CFA. Did I add something that I'm expecting to show up that's not there? Um, it's also a great way to explore the site and see what tags are available, what contexts are available. Um, and then look at the page and say, why is that context on this page? Um, I don't know of a way yet to go uh, to look at your page and s figure out which part of the page uh, is generating a specific, um, is, is requiring a specific context or adding a specific tag. Um, I shouldn't say I don't know that. I think there is a project by Wim Lears, um called RenderViz uh, for render visualization. Um, but it's a, I, I'm not sure what its status is. Um, but I believe it tries to actually build a 3D rendering of your page in a browser, which is kind of crazy. But anyway. What tool did you use to, to create to get this? Uh, in this case, I just use Perl. You can also, if you open the inspector in your web browser, and you click on, you know, your, I filtered it down to documents. I click on localhost because that was the, I just loaded the home page here. Um, and if you look about halfway down, you'll see X Drupal cache context, um, and then X Drupal cache tags, and that lists all the contacts and all the tags. Um, there are a few caveats where you may have pages on your site that have an extremely, extremely large number of nodes, um, and some web servers or proxies, the number of headers can blip a little bit um, if the headers get too big. Uh, that's why this isn't enabled by default. Um, also because really bloated headers make your site slower. Uh, or they're just it's just extra data you don't have to be sending around except for development purposes. Um, and the last tip I'd say, I think, is when you're writing code in Drupal 8, if you're going to output markup that's going to be something that's going to be visible on a page, whether it's a controller or a plugin or a block, um, the first thing I do is you know you step out your your class and you step out your methods. Uh, in this case, say it's a block and has a build method. The first thing I do is specify um, a render array, I return it, and then I stub out cacheable cacheable metadata. Um, this is just habit. I literally copy paste this every single time. Um, the reason being is once I see that there, it's really easy to remember to say, hey, I'm adding, I'm querying nodes. I need to add a dependency on these nodes I'm adding or something else. Um, or I need to add context according to how this item varies, what input I'm taking. Um, but just having that there every single time you start is a great way to remember, to keep it in your mind, like they need to be aware of this. Um, I don't know any great way to evaluate, you know, what the tags you need are, um, or what the context you need are. Um, the best way I can think of is just look at what data you're requiring. Uh, from the request or from parameters or what data you're loading, like nodes, terms, whatever, uh, and just make sure each of those has a corresponding context or tag uh, that needs it. Uh, real quick, you can make your own cache tags if you want. 
Um, you literally do whatever you want, they're just strings. Um, but you should probably namespace it with your model uh, and make sure you have to invalidate yourself. Uh, so here's an example of a project we did where we stored a little bit of data in the state service. Uh, the state service, unlike config and entity, doesn't provide cache tags uh, for your thing. So we just made our, I made my own cache tag there. Uh, I just said, my module state some data. Uh, so when I set that data and store it in there, I make sure I call the cache invalidator service, uh, which you can get from the container that's defined in core.services.yaml, uh, and then I validate that. And then I make sure whenever I print that, uh, at the bottom, this is an example, uh, I just set that as a cache tag and I apply it to my render array. Any questions? General. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Is this the end of your... Oh, almost there. Um, but you can also make uh, context uh, from your own if you want to vary something. Um, it's pretty simple, but it's a little bit more involved. You have to make a class and make a service. Um, that service needs to start with cache context dot whatever it is. You do your module name, uh, probably for namespacing purposes, like cache context my module form. Um, tag it with the name cache dot context. And it has to implement either cache context interface or uh, calculated cache context interface. Um, and there is a base class you can use to start, which is called a request stack cache context base. That's another lovely name. Um, and this is roughly what it would take to make a cache context. Um, it adds, uh, there's, you know, the get label is pretty self explanatory. Uh, the get context function is basically just going to say, look at the request, look at some data, and return a value based on. Uh, what your context is. So if this was a query argument, for example, I would return to literally say, get the request, get the query, get the argument, and return that value. Uh, in this case, this is a, a website that has forms that uh, control access to file downloads. Um, and in this case, um, we show a form when the user hasn't filled it out, but we actually store it in a cookie when they've uh, filled out the form previously. So uh, we need to figure out whether or not to cache the form or the button to do the download. So this says, have they, have they submitted the form? If so, it returns true, and we get a different cache context. Um, and if that depended on um, specific data, you could return cacheable metadata. But most of the time, you can just return an empty, empty object there. Um, to apply that, you would just say, set cache context, uh, my module form, uh, which is the name we used, uh, and you can just specify the parameter on the end, which is like an ID in this case. Um, if I have time, I could do like three or four minutes on how big pipe this ties into big pipe, or we can do questions. Okay, oh, this will go fast. Um, I'll just blow through it. Uh, big pipe was pioneered Facebook, which is a way of uh, loading a page where you load an initial page that has no content on it. Um, and then as content is rendered in the back end of your server, like your news feed on Facebook, uh, your sidebar, your messenger, and all that, um, that is streamed to the user's browser in the initial response, and then it's rendered into the page with the JavaScript library. Um, it works by rendering uh, the RD cache content or the fast bits of the page, sending those to the browser immediately, and then uh, some parts of it are rendered uh, and sent them whenever they're ready. Um, the cool thing is, um, it does not use AJAX, uh, it uses HTTP streaming, so there's only one connection, so it's fairly fast, um, and it basically can work automatically. Um, the trick is, uh, as Peter pointed out earlier, you just have to set the max age of an item to zero, which tells Drupal it can't be cached, um, and in that case, um, it's going to say, I know this is non-cacheable. I'm going to use big pipe to deliver this. I'm going to render the rest of the page first, send that to the users so they can look at it, and I'm going to send this other thing that's slow. Maybe it's talking to an external web API or something. Uh, it does require a session to be open, so you either have to be logged in uh, or open a session in your code. Um, here's an example of a block uh, that uses this. Uh, in this case, at the top, you notice I've actually implemented a function that blocks can have called get cache max age. Um, that actually has to be up there because 
if we define that down here in our code, notice I put a sleep five in there just to simulate a slow code. Um, it wouldn't be able to determine the cache max age until uh, the build was returned. Uh, so it wouldn't actually work. In this case, by putting it up there, it can fetch that cache max age before actually calling the build. Uh, I'm getting that. And a quick demo of that is this site right here. If I click on a page, uh, wait, where's the related items? It's going to take five seconds to figure out how to display those. We can pretend it's talking to another database, and they pop in automatically after they're available. Uh, you can see it shows up there. That's a really cool feature that should be stable in Drupal 8.3, which means ready for production. Does that affect bondage caching? Setting max age to zero? Sorry, say that again. Does that affect bondage caching if max age is set to zero? Like in Drupal 7, it uses max age? Um, not sure how this would behave with varnish, actually. I think you basically have to be logged in to take advantage of this. You said you have to have a session. Yeah. And usually you have to have a session that in bypasses the varnish cache. So you also can have a question using varnish cache and you can set up a VCL. If you think Varnish Cache do this, and um, I don't know if it's been a while, but on the, there's some pages that are over the VCL file. They work today, I think, Varnish. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. I was setting up Drupal 8 on my local mm -hmm. uh, the other day, and I used that development services YAML file and set the cache backend to null. Yeah. But still when I called my function, like I defined a custom date and called my function, I was printing something, it was still not coming from the front end. So yeah. Um, can you repeat the question? Uh, the question is if you were using the development.services.yaml, which specifies the null cache backend, um, but you were using, you were putting pretty not put in your page and it wasn't showing up. Um, after Drupal, Eight beta 16 or so, the last beta, I think. They changed that so that uh, even though the null service is defined in development.services, the render cache is not configured to use it by default. That's commented out in, um, I think that's in the example.settings.local.php. So if you wanted to disable it completely, you would have to go into the example.settings.php and uncomment that line. Um, I had it here. Let me see again. I saw the same thing recently, I was confused, yeah. It's different than cashback. So he's saying there's another step of configuration that needs yeah. to actually work. So at, even if you enable the example.settings.local.php, um, the development.services.yaml actually defines cache.backend.null, but you have to uncomment this line um, in order to actually switch the render cache to use the null backend. Um, so, you my understanding that all of this is to get better performance, but like, what is the cost of calculating how to validate, like, what pieces are, you know, in terms of TPU memory for this, like, in the end? What is the cost of, like, being able to do all of this? And the other question, in one of the headers, and in one of the screenshots that you, sh that you show, it said something like, page, cache, and it's set in uncacheable or something like that. So is there some, yeah, that one. Yeah. Is there some, something that is uncacheable at all? Like you cannot cache, you will never be able to cache? Um, which one was it? As the X Drupal dynamic cache was saying uncacheable. Um, there's a couple other things. Uh, the cache control, which has must revalidate, no cache. That's a Drupalism that's been there for a long, long time. That's the very top. Um, and that's what keeps Drupal able to do dynamic pages. Um, and uh, for a long time, yeah, there's our expires header, which is, of course, Tree's birthday. Um, that's a really famous old patch that basically made sure that you always got a fresh page when you use Drupal. That's a long time ago. Um, dynamic page cache is a separate module. Um, and what that's doing is that's actually working for logged in users. Um, and that's part of this. Yes, it is. There is a lot more computation to this. Um, I think one of the most frustrating things getting started is it's a lot of development overhead thinking about what I need to specify. Um, 
But I think the big benefit actually comes in in the fact that, one, you can actually do caching for logged in users. Um, using the render caching, it'll say, like, this block, I can just recache that. Uh, which prior to, uh, you know, Drupal 8, I and mean, Drupal 7 had a little bit of that. Um, but now Drupal 8 applies that to everything, not just blocks. Um, so even like the node content on the page. Um, the other thing is, um, if you ever get a chance to look up uh, a concept called Russian nesting doll caching, I didn't have the time to get into it here. Um, but the benefit is, is because each thing, like those little blocks are cached, um, when you go to regenerate a page cache, say part of the page has changed. Um, Drupal doesn't have to regenerate every single piece of content on the page. Uh, it's gonna be able to reuse the render cache for say, say something in the left sidebar changes, but the header and the footer are the same. Well, it's gonna say, well the page cache, the whole page is invalid. So I need to regenerate the whole page cache. But in the process of doing that, I already have the header cached and the footer cached. I can reuse those caches. So even, um, even times when like you have to regenerate caches a lot too, that's a performance increase. Um, so even those, like a lot of times when your page cache is clear, even those regenerations are faster now due to the, the render caching, caching components of the page below that. I have a performance chart uh, from a Drupal 7 to 8 launch that I should have put in here. Um, it's pretty dramatic, actually. There you go. Can you define your custom cache context for taxonomic from the previous example? Uh, you could. Um, can you repeat the question? Could we define a custom uh, cache context for a taxonomy term? You certainly could. Um, I'm not sure what the ideal use case for that would be, other than it would seem to be really similar to what you want with URL.page, uh, but you could. Um, it would be similar, you'd say, here's my cache context, my cache context loads the current node. Um, the tricky part would be getting the fields because taxonomy can be in any number of fields. But if you had a site where you wanted to vary based on the taxonomy term of the node, you, you could build a cache context for that. One other question. I know at some point there was a to uh, shorten the cache tag sent to CDMs? You know if that still is something you can do or if that is still in development? I don't know, that's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, because that is one of the concerns is, like like I said, these are good for development, but you wouldn't want to run these in production. Uh, but ironically, you do have to enable these, something like this in production if you're using a CDM and you want the CDM to understand those cache tags. Um, and I haven't actually heard a good answer to that. Okay, I know, I know yeah, your dear was working on like abbreviating these, kind of uh, gzipping them in a sense, like giving a short name to each one instead of the full long name, but I don't know if that made it in or not. Yeah. Be in and of course, HTTP2, which can gzip headers, should alleviate some of that overhead. Um, but anyway. Thanks. Thank so, you um, all. I'll Upload the updated slides. Um, do you have any questions? See you. Thank you.